Good evening, everyone. My name is Carmi Garzion, and I'm the Dean of the College of Science, and thank you for joining us for the fourth and final, sadly, lecture of the surprise twists that transformed science lecture series. And before be we begin tonight, please join me in giving tonight's amazing artist, uh, Carlos Arzante, Arzate, another big round of applause. As we wrap up the series this evening, I want to take a quick moment to thank all of you for joining us for the four outstanding lectures given by the College of Science speakers. It's been great to see so many members of the College of Science community engaged with the lecture series over the past month. From our faculty, our staff, and students, to our val valued Galileo Circle members, and all of the members of the Tucson community, and everyone in between. I sincerely appreciate your support of the lecture series. I would also like to thank our corporate sponsors and media partners, in particular the presenting sponsors, Holua Loa Companies, Raytheon, and the Research Corporation for Science Advancement. I would also like to give a big thank you to Arizona Arts Live for their partnership in helping us bring the lecture series to life right here in Centennial Hall. And in collaboration with the University of Arizona Poetry Center, each lecture has featured an original poem crafted for the evening's topic. Tonight's guest poet is Katherine Larson. Katherine is the author of Radial Symmetry and The Speechless Ones and winner of the Yale Younger Poets Prize and the Vercelli International Civic Poetry Prize. A poet and essayist Larson's work has been published in Orion, the Massachusetts Review, The Scientist, and many other publications. She's also active in organizations and artists uh, dedicated to conservation in the Gulf of California. Catherine, welcome to the stage. Thank you so much, and good evening. I'm honored to be here with you tonight. This poem, Material Science Inventory, was meant to be in conversation with tonight's surprise twist talk, and the idea that a sustainable future must take into account the reduction and management, and as tonight's lecture will demonstrate, the transformation of waste. If you're not familiar with it, the term ghost nets refers to lost or discarded fishing nets that can drift in the ocean for decades and entangle species from seabirds to whales. Material science inventory. Plastic says, forget cathedrals. I'll build you an island in the Pacific three times the size of France out of ghost nets and corpses and bleached ice cream spoons. Don't fret about the sea turtles. I'll make medusas of polyethylene bags and violet shower gel glitter that bloom while being inhaled. You have to understand the quiet obscenity of the way humans create, making then living in the wake of all that waste. Sulfur sighs. Look what you've missed. These yellow cliffs aren't trash. They're simply waiting to be transformed. A chemical shudder capable of becoming strange new forms. Does the seahorse know, curled as she is around the Q-tip drowned two elections ago, that perhaps the narrative of waste is simply the horizon of human imagination? Thank you. 
Thank you, Catherine. That poem perfectly captured uh, some of the things that we're going to learn about tonight. Um, and I would now like to introduce tonight's speaker, Jeff Pyun. Jeff's research focuses on the synthesis, self-assembly, characterization, and device evaluation of novel polymers, nanoparticles, and nanocomposite materials. In the lab, the Pyun Research Group is an internationally renowned group recognized for developments of organic and inorganic hybrid polymers and materials that are being used in a wide range of applications in photonics, energy sustainability, and defense. Jeff has been with the College of Science and the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry since 2004, and we're delighted to have him here tonight. Jeff, please join us uh, on the stage, and let's welcome Jeff. Right. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just, again, want to acknowledge and uh, really uh, show my gratitude to the Dean and also to the College of Science and all of the support staff who've put this exciting seminar series together. Uh, so uh, we've heard some really exciting talks uh, in this series, and I think what I want to do is kind of just pivot the focus of this to like Earth stuff, right? So you heard some really cool like exoplanet black holes and like the importance of like the tree ring lab and how we can use that to like as a time machine to go past and look forward. So I'm gonna talk about like Earth stuff, right? And chemistry and plastics is what I'm gonna talk about today, right? And what I really just wanna say first, cause I know in like, I don't know, like 2024 plastics, right? If you say that, right, it's kind of like a downer because right, we're worried about the effect of plastics on the environment. And I'll talk about that just for a little bit, but I really just want to emphasize that what I'll talk about today is just incredibly exciting and weird and new chemistry that, had been, that was developed by my group and my students and my researchers and collaborators, just like a few buildings down that way, you know, and how it has really transformed so many things around the world and certainly here. So is my, my group here? Pyung group, you guys here? All right, stand up, stand up please real quick. Can you just help me to acknowledge them real quick for being fantastic people, right? And for really making things happen. Man, you guys are so lucky you came to this. You'd be so fired if you hadn't been here for that. You know? All right, so let me uh, talk about what we're gonna talk about today regarding right, a new type of technology, really with chemistry, right? So making stuff. Right? Making new and cool things right, that hopefully can make a difference to modern society. So let me figure out if I can do this. Right? So as I mentioned, right, as we think about plastics right, in a modern sense, like the first thing we sort of think about and worried about is what is the effect of plastics on the environment? Right? And that is a really, really uh, important thing to worry about. Right? And again, if you look at the numbers just for us in this country, right, all of us on average generate about 400 pounds of plastic waste. Right? 400 pounds of anything is hard to imagine, much less plastic, right? You know, so that I think is a natural thing to worry about. And I think that's important, right, to acknowledge what we need to do better, right, as a society to sort of use these materials responsibly, right? But I also just want to point out how important these materials are, right? How modern society, humanity, person, kind, really can't live without plastics, right? And that's really where the role of chemistry, both old and new, right, can really hopefully make a difference. So let's talk about plastics, right? So there's many different kinds of plastics, right? And this gets you into the alphabet soup of P's, right? So PP, PET, PP, PPP, right? Many, many different kinds of plastics. So that's what you kind of look at at the bottom, right, of your different plastics when you have the recycling little arrow thing and the number. So first, let's say there's many different kinds of plastics in the world, right? And as we think about how do we get to like 400 pounds, right, of plastic waste, we start to think about, well, you know, where do I see plastics, right? And I think certainly in our packaging, right? So in our water bottles, in our soda bottles, in our food packaging, we recognize that there's like lots of plastics that we throw away, right? But as we look at other things, right, that are also high volume and important uses of plastic, like our biomedical implants, right? Things that are helping us stay healthy and alive, right? When you go to the dentist and you get a filling, boop, that little light, boop, those are plastics, right? Our portable electronics, right? The thing you're holding in your hand right now. If you were in my class, I'd tell you, put that away, right? Portable electronics, right? Incredibly important, right? Use of plastics, right? 
and also anything related to like optical stuff, right? Things we need to see through, right? Like our glasses, right? Like our lenses, like our displays, right? These are all important uses of plastics that really can't be replaced with other materials, right? And the way you got here, right, in your cars, right? Plastics are lightweight, processable, very versatile, right? So absolutely impossible to imagine a world in the automotive sector without plastics, right? And certainly that goes for the aviation sector, right? We can't fly in planes, right, if they're super heavy, right? You know, they're like, right? So obviously also in the defense sector, aerospace as well, right? We need lightweight, versatile materials. And again, construction and housing, these are all just things where it's really clear. It's really clear why we need plastics, right? So I think that is a testament to why these materials are really, really sort of critical to person and humankind, right? Just like steel, just like wood, just like other kinds of semiconductors, right? You know, so, right, that part's the good part, right? You know, now, let me just sort of, I'm going to toggle back and forth colloquially between from polymer and plastic. So let me just set up that formally as far as what I mean by this, right? So the polymer, right, the polymer is the pure organic material. Right, so that's the poly alphabet soup thing. Polypropylene, PMMA, polystyrene, okay? Plastics, right? Plastics are the polymer plus stuff, right? And the stuff typically is like chemicals, right? So things to make it colored, right? Things to make it like antioxidants so it's stable, you know, like glittery stuff, glow in the dark stuff, you name it, right? So basically plastics, right, are the pure polymer, right? plus additives, okay? So those are the formal definitions of what we mean by polymer and plastic, right? And so I think all of us can appreciate the fact that, again, like the plastic is the good stuff, right? Stuff you want to deploy, right? So I want you to think of plastics as like the birthday cake with all of the birthday detailing, right? That's what plastics are, right? Cake with birthday detailing, okay? Now, what I'm going to mainly talk about today, right, is just the polymer, right? So just the plain cake. Okay, just the plain cake, so no birthday cake today, all right? But don't tell this guy, he's already mad, there's no magician at the party, okay? So just plain cake, please, okay? All right, polymers and plastics. All right, so let me just kind of do a brief little thing as to why, right, plastics as a class of materials are just so important, right? And it's very simply this, it goes back to their chemistry, right? So I think hopefully all of you can remember the periodic table. Right? And as we look at the periodic table, right, carbon, right, this is typically the main sort of chemistry right, that we care about for plastics. Right? So the cool thing about carbon is its chemical diversity. It's chemical diversity. So the class that I and many others teach in my department is organic chemistry, right, which is just the best chemistry. Absolutely. Oh, my department head didn't hear that, but it's the best. Anyway, so it's diversity, right? So carbon can make bonds with numerous atoms, right? With itself in many different kinds of ways. It can make a diversity of many different kinds of molecules, right? And we can use many combinations of those molecules, right? To make polymers and plastics, right? So that, again, right, cannot be done with any other class of materials. You can't do that with metals. You can't do that with semiconductors, okay? So that is the power right, of plastic materials and polymers, right, because of the chemical diversity with carbon, right? So you can make lots of cool different kinds of plastics. They're all not the same, right? So your Tupperware, right, that thing basically you never get back from your neighbors or your aunt or whoever, right? So your Tupperware, right, that's polypropylene, right? One of the most inexpensive, right, and simple chemically, right, plastics we have, right? Also, you have what's known as polyimid, right? Polyimid is like a high temperature polymer, right? almost like an inorganic material with respect to its thermal stability, right? And its mechanical properties. They put it in rocket ships and it's one of the most important high temperature polymers for like electronic stuff, right? And then finally, polymethyl methacrylate, right? Plexiglass, right? You can make plastics that are almost as clear as glass, right? Incredible, right? So that's the cool stuff, right? So that's why plastics are important. We can, with chemistry, right? Control many, many different kinds of things related to the properties of the material, right? So that's why chemistry can make such a difference in, right, the kind of materials that we make. All right, so that's the cool part, right? That sounds good, right? So like, oh my God, right? What's going on with all the bad stuff, right? And the impact, right, of all of the plastic accumulation in the environment, right? That's really the worry right now, especially for the really inexpensive, right? Plastics that are made in very, very large volumes right? Millions of tons every year. Things like polyethylene, polypropylene, 
okay? They were not designed right, to be good for the environment, right? They were not designed to be degradable. So that's why we have, right, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, right, which is, again, like this floating island of garbage, right, across the Pacific that now covers a 20 million, 20 million square kilometer area, right? We have microplastics, right? It just sounds bad. Ah, not good, is it? Right? So microplastics, what are they? Right? Well, all of us just made a bunch of microplastics. Did you realize that? Right? When you drive, right, all your tire rubber dust, right? That's like one of the biggest parts of like microplastics, right? When you did your laundry, right, all the fibers that rub off in your washing machine, those are microplastics. Oh my God, what have we done, right? You know? So these are the things we worry about, right? These are the technologies we need to think about changing, right? And again, right? Tires, things we take for granted, right? We get so mad that tires pop, right? I want these to be durable. And then we're shocked that they're durable. <laughs> we don't know what to do with it. <laughs> so this is where we are. Oh no, we're on fire, <laughs> or we're underwater, or I can't do my laundry, I can't drive. <laughs> oh no, what am I gonna do, right? You know. So how did we get to this, right? How did we get to this? And what I was really interested to realize is that the modern plastics we have only have like 50 to 7 years of deployment time, right? Not that long, right? So let's basically ask someone we trust. Let's ask grandma, okay? And this is an AI, randomly generated grandma. Obviously not. I had no choice in this one, I'm really bad. Okay, anyway. Grandma, right? Grandma was around when most plastics were deployed, right? So like things like polyethylene terephthalate water bottles, patented in the 50s, deployed in the 70s. Okay, so not that long ago, right? So let's ask grandma, why did you guys choose these kinds of plastics, right? Why do we care, right? Because, well, for grandma, when she's driving, we want these tires to be durable, right? Durable. We don't want grandma to be stuck in the desert, right? We want plastics to be light and strong, right? So grandma can take out the garbage. We don't want this mess everywhere, right? We want our plastics to be high performance, right? Precision optics so grandma doesn't bump into things, right? Makes sense, right? These are the things that were thought. Durable, lightweight, high performance, right? But also manufacturable, easy to mold, easy to make into many different kinds of products, right? Way easier than other kinds of materials and inexpensive, like crazy inexpensive, right? Think about this, your garbage, your garbage bag, right? You're putting your garbage in the garbage bag, right? What can be cheaper than garbage, right? Right, you know? So this is, right, what we thought of, right, back in the day, right? Like, that's good enough, good enough. Grandma, start driving, right? Good enough, right? But we didn't, we didn't think about this, right? And 57 years later, Bill's coming to, okay? So that's where we are right now, right? Now, you might say, well, let's just stop using those bad plastics, okay? Grandma will get over it. Let's get over it, okay? Well, it's even worse than that, okay? The reason that we have all of these bad plastics is because we like to drive our cars and we like having energy, okay? So it all comes from our reliance on fossil fuels, okay? So I'm going to put a super, super oversimplified cartoon, right, of oil refining, okay? So we all know that we have crude oil, right? We dig it up from the ground usually, right? And we have to do what's called refining, which is like a million chemical things. Okay, but the refining pretty much is we're doing chemical stuff, right, to the hundreds of things inside of crude oil, that tar-like black substance that you're familiar seeing, and getting out the stuff we want, okay? So 90% of that refining stuff, 90% of what we want goes toward fuels, okay? Fuels that you and I use, right? Fuels like gasoline in our cars, okay? Diesel, right, in our freight line, our 18-wheeler trucks, okay? Kerosene right, in the planes that we fly, okay? Ain't no electric cars for those big guys, right? You know, so this is basically where most of that goes, and we all know about the oil on fire again. I'm sorry, grandma's upset, right? So this is my point. We all know the impact, right, of all these CO2-based emissions, right? We'll talk about that in just a moment, okay? So because of so much of this, right, used for making fuels for transportation, right, which we go through every day. I'll talk about some numbers in just a moment, okay? That means we've got tons of leftover chemicals that we don't use for this, right? Things you can't put into an engine, but are made in enormous volumes, so they're incredibly cheap, okay? So this is why we're stuck with these chemicals, 
right? So these are what we use for stuff, right? Like plastics, okay? These commodity chemicals are so cheap, you'd be crazy not to use them, okay? So, right, you then use these to make plastics, right? These plastics are now cheaper than your garbage, right? So that's where we are. Now, the problem, right, is that most of these chemicals and most of these plastics have bonds, right? So this is the only chemical structure I'll show. There's like a C and another C. This is as simple as you can get. Okay, the dean said, take them out. I said, okay, all right, I'll take them out. I'll take them out. I'll take them out. That's the only one left. Okay, these C's, right, they don't degrade. Okay, and these are the cheapest ones and the largest ones we make. Okay, so because of this reliance, right, on all these chemicals that are inexpensive for transportation and other stuff, that's why we're stuck with this particular problem of plastic accumulation. Okay, so for us to kind of solve the problem, chemistry got us here, so chemistry can hopefully get us out of this, right? And so that's, I think, what I and many other people around the world that are doing polymer chemistry, right, or the chemistry of making plastics are trying to do, right? Can we find new ways of making plastics differently using, right, new chemistry and new kinds of starting materials, right? So that's what we'll talk about today, right? And these are all the young smiling faces. Some of them aren't here, so they're definitely fired. But anyway, so, right, these are the people, right, that have been doing the exciting work here at the University of Arizona, right? So really, really great story, which I'll talk about today. All right, so in terms of, like, what we've done, just a quick, quick, quick one slide, right? So my group, right, since about 2010, right, so we basically solved a major sustainability problem for the oil and gas sector, right? Unsolved since, right, the 70s, right? So again, we were the first to find a way to take this yellow stuff, which I'll just refer to as elemental sulfur or pure sulfur, and find something to do with this, in this case, to make useful plastics, okay? That new chemical process, which I'll talk about, right, is now, again, internationally recognized, global impact, right, in companies and labs all around the world, okay? So this has been exciting to see. And this is like weird polymer stuff, right? Most polymers are made from like C's, right? Carbons, as I talked about, right? So our polymers have like S's, like S, S, S's, right? So they have very weird properties, right? And that makes them really interesting candidates for, right? New applications like you take the plastic, you can make a battery with it. Talk about that, right? And we can also do things like optics. We'll talk about the first use of these kinds of plastics for night vision applications, right? So let's get it. Let's get it. All right. Nope. Let's get it. Okay. Well, okay. We've done a lot of stuff, so never mind that. But yeah. So, uh, but I do want to acknowledge my colleagues at TLA, right? So Tech Launch Arizona. They have been incredibly important in allowing us to file new intellectual property, patents, contracts with all different kinds of crazy companies. Like, again, right, the companies I'll show you in just a second. Right now, to come back to the surprise twist, so let me walk you through this talk, right, as far as the kinds of things that we'll be showing you today. So surprise twist number one I'm going to talk about, right, and it's kind of surprising actually, right, it's how the oil and gas industry saved us from an environmental disaster, right, in the 70s, over 50 years ago. We'll talk about that first, okay. Surprise twist number two, three, and four is like, Cool stuff from the polymers, okay? Cool stuff we didn't expect about these polymers. Number one, the fact that we could even make plastics from sulfur. That was surprise number one. Surprise number three is that you can use these plastics for like battery things, right? And number four, right, how we're gonna find light in the darkness. In the darkness, okay? So we'll talk about that in just a second. All right, so let's first hit these first two things, right? So surprise twist number one is related to acid rain. Okay, so acid rain in the 70s, right, in the 60s, basically as we think about every single drop of water, there's stuff in it, right, and as we put that stuff in our car, right, that gets basically thrown into the atmosphere, right. So normally, right, most of our oil and feedstocks have a certain amount of sulfur kind of containing molecules or chemicals, okay. So every time in the 70s, before everything was, uh, solve basically, you'd have this, right, emission problem, you form sulfurous oxide gases, okay, which in the atmosphere makes sulfuric acid, H2SO4, right, one of the strongest acids we have in the sky raining down on us, okay, acid rain, pretty bad, okay, so that all comes from the fact that every single drop of oil dug from the ground has sulfur containing stuff in it, okay, so what did they do? They did a cool chemical thing, Right? The oil industry developed a process that really is one of the modern triumphs of chemical catalysis. Okay? I was also told not to talk about this, but I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Okay? So, right, what they do right, is they crack 
right? Every single sulfur-containing molecule, like an egg, except they call it cracking. So you crack it, you break all the bonds, you release the sulfur stuff as a gas. Okay, that's step one, from all is oil. That gas is H2S, H2S hydrogen sulfide. It's like H2O, right? Except you replace the oxygen with the sulfur and H2S will kill you, okay? So don't drink this stuff, okay? H2S, right? Step one, you cracked all of the things that have sulfur bonds in the gas, it releases the gas, right? Step two, you capture that gas, you hit it with oxygen, okay? That makes sulfur, which I'll show you in a second. Okay, now, you do a bunch of other refining, obviously, the oil, right? Dot, 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 right? And that's what we're used to, right? This is what we pump into our cars, right? This nice, clear, high-energy oil, right? And again, what we don't want is all the sulfur stuff that causes acid rain, okay? So this yellow form, elemental sulfur, that's the byproduct, okay? You take out as much of this as you can, and hence acid rain, for the most part, has been solved since the 70s, okay? So a pretty cool uh, type of advance, right? Now, Elemental sulfur, right, you can think of now as a waste, right, or a byproduct of oil refining, okay, because there aren't many uses of elemental sulfur, right? Now, let's put this into sort of a more general context specific to us, okay? So in this country, we still consume about 20 million barrels of oil every day. Not make, consume, okay? Now, every single drop of oil has about 1 to 5 percent sulfur, okay? So you start to do the math right, 20 million barrels of oil a day, right, one to five percent, right, so that means each of us, when you drive your car every year, we're generating one to 500 pounds of sulfur annually, okay, so easily your weight in sulfur, okay, so congratulations us, we did it, okay, so this is the sort of math here, okay, now, it's not just us, okay, anywhere that has oil, anywhere that needs to refine oil has this same problem, okay, so the tar sands regions in Alberta, right, this is where the Keystone Pipeline, right, is coming through, right, they have about 20% sulfur stuff in their oil, okay, so it's only going to accumulate, okay. You go to Kazakhstan, right, they have a lot of these new unconventional oil fields, right, that's also got 20% sulfur in all these unconventional oil feedstocks. You go to the United Arab Emirates in Abu Dhabi, they have 40% sulfur, yikes, okay, so, as we look for these unconventional oil fields, right, we're going to see that we're going to meet a lot more sulfur. So these particular ads predate, right, by many years, the work that we've done, right? So Kazakhstan's waste sulfur poses serious ecological problems, right? We were actually approached by, like, the son of the president of Kazakhstan. Great story. I'll buy, tell me, I'll, well, I'll tell you that later. Okay, so, <laughs> right, so there's going to be a lot of sulfur. So the point being is, right, there's going to be more sulfur in the world than we know what to do with. Right, so could we do something with this that'll actually be good for the environment and good for plastics? Okay, so that's surprise twist number one. Okay, the oil and gas industry saved us from acid rain, but created this other unintentional consequence, right? Sulfur everywhere, all right? So surprise twist number two, that's here, done here, right? About, I don't know, I keep losing date, let's say 2010-ish, right? Can you make plastics with this? And yes, you can. Okay, so this is all the chemical stuff I was told not to talk about. That's the first part, right? Now, what we do, right, we take all the yellow stuff, and that's my job right there, the one that says new polymer chemistry. That's us. We did it, okay? So can we find ways to then take this, right, very abundant, right, difficult to use chemical and make high-value plastics from that? And yes, we have, okay? So we just went through, right, where most plastics come from, right? So most plastics come from petroleum feedstocks, right, because nothing's cheaper or more abundant than these feedstocks, okay. More recently, in the past 20, 30 years, right, there's been a push to do green plastics, right. So the idea being is rather than use petroleum, right, derived chemicals, can we use something like, you know, things that come from corn, right. We have lots of corn in this country. Use chemicals that come from corn, right, or sugarcane, right, tons of sugarcane in South America, okay. So not black or green, right, but can we use yellow chemistry? Can we use this stuff for the first time to make a new class of high-value plastics, right? So that's kind of what we've done here. So this is the process of inverse vulcanization, right, and again, this seems really simple. It was really painful, okay, but nevertheless, right, we can take sulfur, and kind of the crazy thing, we, we, we tried a bunch of, like, fancy stuff, dissolve it, do this, right, and we kind of gave up and said, just melt the sulfur, put stuff in it, cross your fingers, right, and that actually worked great, you know, so in one step, right, you can actually make this very, very high value of sulfur plastic, 
Okay, so in terms of the chemical name for this, the technical name, right, is we start with chemicals that are not connected, right? So monomer forms one merge of these, right? And again, when we want to make a polymer, we're connecting chemically the mers, okay? So more or less the process of making a polymer is connecting the mers, right? And that mer connectivity is known as a polymerization. Okay, so that is the chemical term for what we've done here. And we invented a new polymerization with a brand new feedstock that nobody wanted. Okay, so very difficult to invent truly new polymerization reactions, and this is certainly one of them. You know, so what's cool now, right, is because we're doing chemistry, I can now react the sulfur with other molecules, right? And now by that modularity, by that choice, by that skill, by that creativity, Right? Now we can control the properties of these materials for the first time using something that the oil and gas industry didn't know what to do with. So make all different kinds of things just like you do with regular plastics. Okay, so as a consequence of that, like that's kind of what you want if you're a chemical technologist, right? Take one process, change its properties, right? Cash in, right? Do lots of different things, you know? So that's been exciting for us to work with chemical companies all around the world, from oil companies to defense companies. So this has been an exciting sort of evolution to see where this goes. So I'll talk about some of these projects in just a second, okay? So the biggest thing though, right? If this is a real plastic, you should be able to do like plastic stuff. Right? Make things, as I told you. Right? So this was one of the first demonstrations of how you could take sulfur, use our chemical process to make a plastic, and do molding, polymer stuff. Right? So you mold this, you cast it in molten form, put it into an object, so you can do all different kinds of things. Right? Here's our U of A logo. Right? Here's a sulfur Lego my daughter helped me to make. Here's a sulfur tire. Right? And the lenses part we'll talk about. Okay? But it gets even more fun. Right? So my students, the very early ones, they took this. They took a record. Right? Uh, I'm sorry, um, time out. Young people, this is called the record. <laughs> okay? It's for music. Time in? Okay, so. It took Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Southern Cross. Okay? Sulfur record. Bam! Okay? Molding. Okay? Now, why did we do this? Well, <laughs> I don't ask questions, right? But again, why did, we, why did they do this, right? Because, again, right, to play a record, you must have precision in that molding. Okay? So if this thing is actually sexy molded, this sucker should play. And? Okay, so I'll just sing it. It's cross your silly. I got my ship, and all the flags are a flying. <laughs> They're all that I have left. And. <laughs> Someone's messing me back there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Don't worry. Okay, oh my god. So don't worry, Dean Girls, you know, I'm not going to quit my day job. It's okay, I'll, I'll stick to this. Now, I'm not saying we should make a bunch of sulfur records, right? But I'm showing you, you can do real polymer stuff for the first time, and that had not been done before, so that was really exciting. Okay, so, right, that's surprise twist number two. You can do polymer plastic stuff, right, because of this new process, right? Now, surprise twist number three. Right? And this pertains to what people said to me. Why would you want polymer plastic with a lot of S's made from sulfur? This sounds stupid. Right? So you know, I went back to my office, you know, cried, <laughs> stuck my thumb, <laughs> cried. Right? And then we're like, all right, right, let's find good uses for them. Right? And that's basically where we use them right, for the first time in making batteries. Okay? So batteries, right? lithium-ion technology. I think most of us have an appreciation of where these are important and where we want them to be important and used. Right? So again, right, if you look at the little tiny batteries, right, you have these coin cells, right, these CR2032 coin cells, these pouches, and these little things called these 18650 batteries, a little bit larger than a AA battery. Okay? So I think all of us have an appreciation for these in our portable electronics, because right? we're always mad that they're dying, right? but we know they're there. Right? And again, if you want to put these in electric cars, that's a big push now, you'll assemble each of these individual cells into larger modules or packs. Okay, and you want these to basically give you longer range when you're driving. Okay, but it doesn't stop there, right? So in, in addition to transportation, we want to use these, right, for backup grid storage, like for Tucson Electric Power where we live, right? So we're going to take these modules, put them into what look like giant server racks, okay? Fill these racks into containers and fill fields of these, right? And so the idea being, can we use this as a backup, right, for off-peak hours, okay? So lithium-ion batteries, right? We appreciate this, right? I'm sorry. On top of that, many of you already have, right, 
electric vehicles, right? So those of you with fancy electric vehicles, congratulations. Have any of you ever taken apart your fancy car and looked at the bottom of it to see the battery? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So for the Tesla S, right, it's made of, the, the batteries are actually these little tiny batteries known as 18650 batteries. They're a little bit larger than a AA battery. Okay, a Tesla S has 7,000 of these little guys. Okay, 7,000, right? Packed into these little arrays here, right? 16 modules, right? Can you imagine? Oh, I dropped all seven. <laughs> right? So I don't have to be a battery expert to know this can't be the best way of making batteries, right? Why are they so heavy? Why do they take so much of the footprint? I'd like this to have a smaller form factor, which means better batteries, more efficient, right? Lighter weight, okay? So, that points to newer and better battery technology. So one such kind of technology is a different kind of battery chemistry. Okay, so that's where the term electrochemistry comes from, right? So another kind of battery chemistry is known as a lithium sulfur battery, okay? So actually in this case, pure sulfur, right, is a very important charge containing part of the battery, okay? Lithium metal is the other side of it, right? Now, if you take a look at this battery, right, it's got five to six times higher charge capacity than lithium ion. You go, oh, that's great, right? That means I should be able to drive my car, right, for a much longer time without needing to charge it, right, in principle, right? But the biggest problem with the lithium sulfur battery, even though it starts with a very high capacity, it dies, okay? So after a few hundred, a hundred discharge, recharge cycles, the whole battery's dead, okay? So poor grandma, still stuck in the desert, all right? So, Right? Now, lithium ion, right, it has a much lower right, charge capacity, but again, this can go to a thousand cycles only losing a few percent of that initial capacity. Okay? So the idea would be, can we combine the high capacity of lithium sulfur with right, the long lifetime of lithium ion batteries? Okay? So these are the batteries we learned how to make in my lab. So it's a little tiny coin cell, it's about the size of what you would see like in a watch. Right? So it's a, 20, it's a CR. 2032 battery, right? And this is basically the battery that you see up here. You have different components, right? And so there's a lot of different gaskets you don't have to worry about, but the lithium metal is one part of the electrode. The other electrode is the cathode, or the positive electrode. And that's where we're gonna put our sulfur material to do the charge business, right? So what you do to make that cathode, that one piece, right, of the electrode is you take a piece of aluminum foil and you're gonna make a slurry coating, right, of these components, right? So the charge part is just pure sulfur, Right, that's gonna do the electrochemical charge business. A little bit of a conductive carbon and a polymer binder to hold this together. Slurry it up, coat it on, punch out a circle, and put this into the battery. Okay, so we got pretty good at making this. We actually taught high school students how to do this. And this particular plot here is just showing you what happens as you cycle this battery. Okay, so cycle number, that refers to the number of times we discharge the battery, recharge it. Discharge it and recharge it. Okay, so you can see we start initially really good. The y-axis is capacity, right? So how much charge, right, milliamps per gram of the material. So man, we start at 1,200 milliamp per hour, whoo, right? Whoo, it's five times higher lithium ion, right? After 50 cycles, uh, okay, we're, we're still okay, right? 800 milliamp per hour, right? But after 100 cycles, battery's dead, and again, grandma's stuck in the desert. Grandma's having a rough day, right? So, right, this is what happens with regular sulfur batteries. Okay, conversely, right, right, this is the problem, right, it's a problem. Now, many companies are working around this, but this is historically the issue with these kind of batteries. Okay, now, you do everything the same, okay, everything the same, but you take our sulfur plastic. In this case, it's 90% sulfur. It's practically sulfur, right, but it now has this improved properties, better sort of mechanical properties, and now take a look. It retains its capacity over a much, much longer lifetime. Okay, able to act as a battery over a much longer number of cycles. Okay, so really, really unexpected result from this, right? And again, we sort of looked into why this was the case. So if you take a look on the left, right, this is a picture, right, of basically a post-mortem of a dead battery. So we basically took apart the sulfur battery after 100 cycles and basically used an instrument known as a scanning electron microscope. So whoosh, zooming in, okay? And as we can see, right, the sulfur battery is totally cracked. Right? And that makes sense if you know about this chemistry because every time you charge and discharge, charge and discharge, you're imposing a lot of mechanical damage, right? A lot of volumetric changes, okay? So boom, this battery's dead, okay? Conversely, with our plastic sulfur, much better retention of that cathode, right? And so we're kind of surprised that the polymer would kind of act as a plasticizer, right? Giving us better integrity as we cycle, right? So that was kind of a really unexpected result.
Okay, but cool, right? We demonstrated something unique, right, about this new sulfur plastic. All right, so last part, home stretch. Okay, home stretch is finding light in the darkness with these plastics. Finding light in the darkness. It sounds like a religious experience, right? <laughs> right? I promise you it's not, right? It's about night vision, okay? Infrared photons, okay? So one of the really weird things is these plastics have unprecedented optical properties. Unprecedented, okay? We have the highest refractive index of any plastic ever made, period. Belt, champ, boom, okay? Really shocking. Okay, really shocking. Now, what does that mean, highest refractive index? I didn't know for a while. That's why I have a good colleague in optical sciences. So again, the ability to focus light through a medium, right? Transparency, right? So you can see here, right, that because of the high refractive index, we have really, really large magnification of the tiny print, right? The ability to focus things, magnify things, right? For your eyewear, right, the higher the refractive index, you can bend more light through a thinner and less amount of that material. Okay, so no more Coke bottles like we used to have in the old days when they made a glass. Okay, so that's all really good. Now, what else? Well, because they're made of so much sulfur, they have unprecedented infrared transparency. Okay, light can go through this, so now we can actually use these for making infrared night vision lenses, right? So this is the first class of plastics you can use for infrared, and I'll tell you why in a second, that's really difficult. Okay, so as far as optic stuff, I just recently started doing this, right? So I realize most of you don't know much about photonics or optics. Okay, so what are we talking about? Transmission, right? And transmission has a few different kinds, right? So for your glasses, right, a special kind of transmission is refraction, right? Bending light into the back of your eyeball, optic nerve, right? Refraction, okay? Also rotation, right? Also very useful a property for light, for transmission, and of course reflection, which is not transmission, okay? So to give you a sense of what we accomplished, let's do a quick experiment together. Ready? For optical transmission, I need your full participation, please, okay? Now, I'm gonna ask you a question, but first things first, close your eyes. But maybe first, grab your wallets or stuff, so nothing weird happens. Okay, close your eyes, okay? Now, what is the transparency of your eyelids? Can you see anything? Okay, well, oh, good participation. Okay, right? So you're like, this is a stupid experiment. Eh, let's see, okay? So, is it really 0%? Fine, now, if it's 0%, put your hands in front of your closed eyelids. What happened? Did it get darker? Did it get brighter? It got darker. Oh, so not so smart now, huh? Right? <laughs> it's transparent. Right? You know? So that's what we mean, right? Transparency, right? How do we basically, right, understand light through things, right? And so I'm like, Professor Brown, I can't see anything. <laughs> you got to go to the doctor and get that procedure thing done. All right. So let's talk about this, right? So what we're going to talk about here for night vision is in this slice right here in the infrared, okay? Way beyond what we can see with these, right, optical spectrometers, okay? So in the infrared, that's where we want night vision. Okay, and so again, I think all of us are used to this kind of imaging and this kind of technology, right? Very important for US defense systems, right? Because it's the best technology for seeing in the dark, okay? But also tremendous applications for things non-defense, right? Medical applications, right? During COVID, right? All of this rapid screening of our temperatures, right? Housing and transportation, right? If somebody, if grandma falls over, <laughs> rough day for grandma, right? right? That would be great, right? Night vision for cars, right? And the reason that's so powerful is because human beings, we emit infrared photons, okay? That's the bottom line of this, right? So again, for housing, right? You could see if something's going on, right? For crowd control, right? You could monitor behavior of large numbers of people, right? And again, this image right here, right? This is what the United States government is doing us right now. U.S. government is watching us and watching us, and watching where you're going, and where you're going, right? So, infrared technology, okay? So, how does this work? Why are we infrared Christmas trees? Well, I'm not a physicist, but it's very simple, okay? Black body radiation physics says if you hold an equilibrium temperature, right, you're gonna emit photons. Pretty simple, okay? So the sun is really hot, right, 5,000 Kelvin, so it emits high energy photons in the UV, visible in a little bit of the near IR, okay? Human beings, we are not 5,000 Kelvin, right? So we emit much lower energy photons, hence in the infrared we emit, okay? So that's why we light up as IR Christmas trees. Okay, so I think we're used to this, right? So some IR imaging, right? So the dark parts are basically cool, light parts are warm, okay? This is a stinky shoe, right? I think we know what not to do in here, okay? Damn teenagers, okay, right? And this is why your mom says don't eat sushi at the 7-Eleven, right? Cause this is cool and this will kill you. Right? IR imaging, right? Save the day. 
Now, what else could it be good for? Our smartphones, right? Portable applications of this, right? Lots of things it could basically protect you from, right? So you could imagine if you had one, and these are now being sold right now, you could see, is there someone in the darkness waiting to kill you? Is there an animal waiting in the darkness waiting to kill you? Is your friend packing heat ready to kill you? <laughs> right? Or you want to stare at a toilet like this guy. <laughs> okay, so lots of different technologies. Okay, and on top of that, night vision for cars, right? So again, there's strong interest from the automotive sector to use infrared imaging for nighttime because, right, when you get in a nighttime collision, you're five times more likely to die, right? So, right, there's an urgent need for less expensive cameras because most of these cameras are extremely expensive, right? So the cameras you have right now with the camera and electronics, it's like, you know, on the order of $20,000. Right, which is more than some of the cars you'd like to put it in. Right? So we're working with the Hyundai Motor Group to try to lower the cost of these cameras. Okay? Lower the cost so they can have wider deployment. Okay? And so this is where we have the opportunity. Right? So this is a typical IR camera system. Right? And the biggest thing we can do to lower the cost, right, to widen the deployment in consumer markets, is the optics. Okay? Plastic stuff, but right now those optics are made from very expensive materials very expensive inorganic materials, a semiconductor like germanium or calcogenide-based materials. Okay, so if we can find a way to lower the cost of the lenses, that would allow for wider deployment potentially, right? So that's what we're trying to do now, right? Plastics have never been used, ever, for this particular application. If successful, right, tremendous impact both in this sector but also in larger society. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do here, right? So this was the very first mid-IR long wave IR, sorry, mid-IR night vision image we took, right, through our particular sulfur polymer, right? Really good, right? Resolution of a human subject. In this case, the subject was, right? He was the, the uh, student who invented this polymer. So now you do the same thing, same experiment, but through the best optical plastic known to person kind, plexiglass, right? Ooh, plexiglass is really clear. Eh, not in the infrared, okay? Totally opaque in the infrared. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Totally opaque in the infrared. Okay. Because all of the carbon stuff is absorbing. Okay. So that's why I had you do that thing in front of your eyes. Right. Totally opaque. Right. Because of this particular carbon material. So again, right. Our particular plastic, very, very successful for doing infrared imaging. So now we're developing new kinds of chemistry. That's the thing up top. New kinds of materials. Fabrication of lenses putting them into different systems, right? And that's something we can do at the University of Arizona because we work together, right, with people in engineering and in optics. So we can take it through the whole run and fail and cry and go back again and cry and go back again, right? So this is the beauty of academics, okay? So we're now developing, right, new different kinds of imaging systems. So we can take our materials, we can make lenses, we can develop standardized imaging experiments for these, right? So these are examples of the kind of measurements we can make. We can make thin lenses, thick lenses. We can compare their imaging quality here, right? And again, we can demonstrate for the first time that we can use these for night vision, which is really exciting. Okay, so for future work, right, not related to night vision, but just in general, right, what we want to do is take advantage of the fact that sulfur polymers made from our chemistry have these sulfur bonds that are easily degradable, okay? So in the future, what we're doing, which is a very common topic now, can we develop sustainable cradle-to-grave type processes? So as we make the material, put it into a product, extract it from the product, recycle it, degrade it, use it again without having, right, negative sort of accumulation in the environment. So this is a longer-term project that we're looking to develop. Okay. So the last thing, just to wrap up here, the not so surprising twist, not a surprise at all, is that this place would be the perfect place to do all this cool stuff, you know? So I've had a number of different exciting collaborators through the years, right? So Dick Glass here at the University of Arizona introduced me to sulfur chemistry, right? Uh, I've also had joint appointments and still do at Seoul National University and Korean universities. They brought all the battery technology expertise here so that we could do this here, right? And of course, my colleague at the University of Delaware for rheology, Okay, my students in 2014, 2019 shown here did most of the work I talked about today. They have now gone on to be professors and successful industrial chemists of their own. So really exciting. And again, my longtime collaborator for optics, Professor Nord, who really changed right, the way that we do research in my group because he taught us optics. 
right? And again, my current collaborators, we have basically a large team funded for the NSF DEMREF program. This is really cool because we're now using computation and machine learning to accelerate materials discovery. So that's being led by Dennis Lichtenberger and Jean-Luc Breda. And again, Jan Yardstein and Margaret are very talented organic chemists who makes like drugs. He's now helping us to make new kinds of polymers. And again, we have a, a really exciting interdisciplinary group of students. But the really exciting thing too on top of that is we're able, because we have a large cohort of people, to bring in even more undergraduates, right? So every semester we have anywhere from 30 to 40 undergraduates working with us. Really exciting opportunity to integrate them and show them what we're doing. Okay, so those are the surprise twists. These are the people I've acknowledged throughout my talk. But again, I really want to thank, again, the college, the dean, and all of you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. So I just go. Yeah, yeah, hang here. So I just want to say, um, Jeff and the many other lectures uh, that you saw demonstrates that scientists really do have more fun. We just love what we do. Um, and Jeff really brought that humor uh, to light uh, today. But this is also a unique talk in that it shows how surprise twists can really lead to exciting new inventions that literally transform our lives and improve our lives. So we're, we're glad to really finish off the lecture series uh, with that uh, lesson uh, for our friends here in Tucson. Um, and so let's thank Jeff again. And I'm, we're going to welcome you to come up and uh, ask questions, meet Jeff afterwards. But uh, for those of you who want to get going, we just want to thank you again for joining us for a surprise twist that transformed science um, from black holes to tree ring research to exoplanets and sustainable plastics. I hope you enjoyed the talks this year and learned about some of the transformative research happening across the College of Science and at the University of Arizona. If you missed any of our lectures, they are all online and will be forever. And so you can find the recordings uh, on our website and the YouTube channel. Thank you again and please go home safely and please come up and say hi to Jeff and ask questions if you'd like. Thank you very much. <laughs>